Hey everyone, welcome back to the course. So in the last video we talked about the differences between criminal, civil, and administrative investigations. We also talked about ETI or Enterprise Theory of Investigation and why that's being used. So in this video we're going to wrap up our discussion in Module 1. We're going to talk about the Federal Rules of Evidence. We'll also talk about different laws that are pertinent to uh, for, uh, forensic investigation as well as uh, we'll finally figure out if you didn't know already what SWGDE stands for. So the Federal Rules of Evidence. Now this is not an all-inclusive list. Um, these are some of the most common ones I think you're probably going to um, see in some capacity on the exam itself. Um, however, you, you'll want to study all the Federal Rules of Evidence just to make sure you're familiar with them. So uh, some of the key ones there I think you should kind of memorize off this list are going to be Rule 103, the rulings on evidence, as well as Rule 105, limited admissibility. And then also Rule 502, Attorney-Client Privilege. So again, this is not an all-inclusive list, and um, I obviously can't tell you what's on the exam because I may not know myself. And uh, again, you, you just want to make sure you study the federal rules of evidence, uh, all of them. So different laws that are pertinent for a, a digital or, or computer forensic investigator. Um, the main one here is going to be Title 18 United States Code, subsection 1030, which is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Again, we talked about that a little bit earlier um, as far as that kind of be that umbrella uh, law that um, like federal law enforcement ag agencies might grab you on if you start hacking uh, systems that you don't have permission to do. We also have uh, Title 18 United States Code, uh, subsection 2252A, which covers child pornography, um, and as well as uh, subsection 2252B that covers misleading domains. Now, um, you know, if on your exam you happen to see something about like 2252 and it just has one of these two listed, it doesn't, uh, you know, differentiate between A or B, um, that's probably your answer, right? If you see one of those and it says 2252, that's probably your answer. Um, again, I don't know if you're going to see that on the exam, but just know that um, if it's broken down like that, you might just see it listed in EC Council exams. It's just like the actual, um, you know, subsection 2252 or like, you know, you know, 5862 or whatever the case might be. Uh, some other laws are FISMA, GLBA, HIPAA, SOX, and, and uh, PCI DSS is actually standard. So FISMA, that's the Federal Information Security Management Act. Uh, so basically this one uh, covers federal agencies and requires them to have an information security um, plan in place for their systems. And so uh, here this act just kind of requires them to annually review it and make sure that um, it's still relevant. GLBA or the Graham Leach Bliley Act. So that requires financial institutions to protect their customer information. Um, so uh, think of this one as like the banking one. Uh, so if you, if you see this on the exam or if you see something maybe asking you like, you know, which one covers like banking institutions, um, focus on this one being, being the correct answer there. HIPAA, which we, uh, we cover like in the CEH uh, material. Um, uh, so the certified ethical hacker material, but um, basically that's just a healthcare one. So HIPAA is designed to help protect uh, patient data. So not just your social security number, your date of birth, but also your actual medical record, right? So that those surgeries you got or, you know, the surgeries that your grandmother got, that sort of stuff. SOX or Sabanis Oxley Act. Um, so this one, if anyone remembers the Enron and like WorldCom uh, scandals from the early 2000s, um, this act was passed to help protect invent, uh, investors, excuse me, against, um, you know, fraudulent uh, accounting practices in corporations. So, uh, you know, with those scandals, the, the investors didn't know and neither, neither did like regular people um, like you or I. Um, they didn't know that the uh, the companies like Enron were essentially cooking the books. Right. So um, SOX was put in place to make sure there's uh, certain controls. Um, so basically, like, you know, nowadays executives have to sign off on the financial reports and they can be held criminally liable um, as well as civilly liable if there's some issue with those reports. PCI DSS, as I mentioned, is a standard. Um, it's very beneficial for like smaller companies that are looking, um, that aren't in the payment card industry that are looking for just kind of like what what kind of security stuff should I put in place uh, because it has, has a lot of good information. Now, uh, payment card industry uh, data security standard is what it stands for. And obviously that with that name, um, it's for the payment card industry. So people or companies that are uh, processing like payment card information, um, it sets certain standards that they have to follow to secure that data. The Fourth Amendment. So um, basically, anyone acting under the cover uh, the cover of go uh, government authority, uh, excuse me, the color of government authority. Uh, so like you know your federal law enforcement or your you know your local law enforcement um, agents. Uh, basically, it's, it specifies that you know they can't search or seize things without a warrant. 
um, from areas where somebody has a reasonable expectation of privacy, right? So um, one thing that people mess up on a lot is they think that because of the Fourth Amendment, their employer can't, uh, you know, come search their stuff. However, um, you know, of course, it depends on your state, but uh, the Fourth Amendment only covers people acting under the co uh, the uh, color of government authority, right? So, you know, like if law enforcement came to your job and they want to search your bag, they would need a warrant, right? Or they would need your permission. Um, whereas, and again, this is not legal advice, so um, I'm not an attorney. I'm not giving legal advice. I'll throw that disclaimer in there real quick. Uh, but, you know, they, they would need a warrant to search your bag in most cases. Uh, whereas, you know, like your boss, if you sign a piece of paper and you consent for your boss to search it, your boss can look through your bag without a warrant. Now, we're going to cover warrants in uh, Module 2 and kind of talk about the different ones, uh, but uh, just know that the Fourth Amendment is tied into that aspect of it. Best evidence rule. So um, basically here the goal is to prevent alteration of the digital evidence. Um, and so the best evidence is like, hey, it's not uh, altered. Um, so we want to use that original evidence in the actual court of law. Now, uh, a duplicate of the evidence is admissible if it meets one of these criteria, right? So the original evidence is destroyed in like a fire or flood or other, you know, act of nature. Um, the original evidence is destroyed in the normal course of business, right? So uh, we, as investigators, as we're analyzing evidence, we may actually destroy some of it just because it's volatile evidence. And then the original evidence is in possession of a third party, right? So, uh, you know, that, that, uh, you know, child porn criminal, um, has their laptop, has the information on there. We can't necessarily get to their laptop, right? But we can, uh, you know, they upload it to their website. So we can access their website. We can get warrants for that and get the, the do basically the same data, right? But we can't get actual access to their physical machine. SWGDE, as we talked about um, in the pre-assessment question for all these videos, it's Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence. So uh, several standards involved there um, that they have. So um, they kind of make organizations follow this forensics, uh, uh, well, companies conducting forensic examinations. Um, so uh, you, you have to maintain an SOP document, review it annually. Um, it has to be accepted by the kind of the general community, uh, the general forensic community. Uh, written copies of technical procedures, we need those as well. And then we also would have to use appropriate hardware and software, right? So we couldn't just like make up uh, software. It needs to be stuff that's generally accepted or approved by the forensic industry. And then, of course, recording all activities uh, for review or uh, testimony if you need to uh, present it in a court of law. So forensic any, uh, readiness is uh, kind of along the lines, if you have a business background, uh, kind of along the lines of like a lean startup, right? So uh, we want to make optimal use of our resources. So in this case, um, optimal use of the digital evidence um, in, a, in a potentially limited time frame with limited investigation costs. So again, cost being a factor there um, and, and kind of tying that in with like lean startup methodology of we want to keep costs low and kind of be uh, you know innovative on our approach. And then incident response. So, um, you know, forensics and incident response kind of tie together. So incident response, right, you figured out something happened and now you want to like actually take a deep dive and figure out, uh, you know, like everything that happened, right? How'd they get in, all this sort of stuff. So that's where the forensics would tie into it, where we're going like a deep dive in malware analysis. We're taking a deep dive in that data breach to figure out like in the logs where exactly they got in, what vulnerabilities we have, how can we patch those, et cetera, et cetera. So again, we're not really um, creating this course on incident response. This one's more so along the lines of forensics. However, just understand that um, if you work in incident response, you're going to be handling forensics in some capacity. For, uh, speaking of forensics, forensic investigator, right? So uh, kind of what do they do? So they, they evaluate any damage, um, right? They also identify and recover data. So we kind of plan out like, okay, um, what's the evidence we're looking for? Let's go get it. Uh, uh, extracting the evidence in a sound manner, so following, you know, best practices and along, along with that proper handling of the data, uh, creating reports off what our findings are, and then, you know, if applicable, testing, filing in court, and then also staying abreast of current technologies and current best practices, right? So as new uh, forensic tools come out, then, you know, we want to be on those, learning, learning those so we can use them uh, on investigations. So ethics, you know, this is kind of common sense stuff. You know, we want to uh, maintain fairness and integrity at all time. And if we have conflict of interest, we want to make sure we address that and take ourselves off the case. Uh, so, for example, you know, if your grandmother committed a crime, you would not be the one investigating that crime necessarily. Um, you know, of course, we know like federal law enforcement says, hey, are you willing to arrest your grandmother as part of this interview process? But um, keep in mind that they wouldn't be putting you on a case of your grandmother because there's a conflict of interest. So just a couple uh, quick post-assessment questions. So um, which of these uh, laws or uh, standards protects patient data? 
All right, so if you guessed answer C, HIPAA, you are correct. Um, again, uh, answer A, graham leach bliley Act, is regarding uh, banking institutions, financial institutions, to protect their customer data. Uh, answer B, SOX or Sabanis Oxley, uh, Oxley Act, is to protect investors against uh, fraudulent corporate accounting. And then uh, answer D is PCI DSS standard or payment card industry uh, data security standard, and that one covers uh, protecting cardholder data. So question number two, digital forensic investigators should never document. So is that true or false? Well, obviously we know that's false, right? Um, we want a document and uh, as we mentioned throughout the entire course, a chain of custody, doc uh, custody document. All right, so in this video, we talked about quite a bit of stuff. We talked about the federal rules of evidence. We talked about different uh, laws and standards, um, as well as like the Fourth Amendment. We also talked about things like the best evidence rule and the scientific working group on digital evidence. So the next module, we're going to jump into module two of the computer investigation uh, process. So we're going to talk about the pre-investigation, the investigation phase, as well as the post-investigation phase.